There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. And the horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waited for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our hearts shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. I want to affirm to you, this text is fulfilled as we come together after a year of being apart from one another. God has kept us alive in a famine. And if you're not rejoicing now because of some trial, don't get used to not rejoicing. Because we shall rejoice. That's the work of God and our salvation. So I encourage you to be, be of good courage, be of good hope tonight. My affirmation tonight is that we have a king that has dominion. The text is found in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I'm just going to kind of take out a phrase there, and I'll read the text in just a second. There was given him dominion, and that's what I'm going to focus on tonight. Before I do that, I, 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 I have confidence here that I have a people before me that, like those Greeks that came to inquire of Jesus, said, we would see Jesus. I assume we have that kind of a crowd here tonight. I've preached before people that really would not want to see Jesus, and I didn't know that until I declared Jesus to them. So I'm thankful to be in the midst of brethren. It's a warm company, and that's important for a preacher. I'm sure that you understand that. I want to tonight to declare some things about salvation. I feel like it's going to give good direction to our sermon as we look at the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, as you know, particularly in these last times, has been a very exploited book for personal gain and profit. The texts that are within the book of Daniel have been taken out of context and have been made to say things that God never intended to be said. We come out sometimes out of the book of Daniel with those who would not divide the word of truth lightly, rightly with a Savior that really doesn't save. He's a king that has dominion, but it's... It doesn't sound like the kind of dominion that we read from the apostles. So I want to make sure that we have these affirmations before us about salvation because they're going to bear upon this text as we look at it tonight. Salvation is an exclusive work of God. By that I mean God is doing for men things that men cannot do for themselves. Tell me, where can you go in the earth and find a changed affection? Where can you be made new in any quadrant of the earth? Where in the earth can you go to receive grace to help in time of need? Huh? Where can you find that? Where can you find the kind of strength anywhere in the world to resist the devil and to ultimately be an overcomer in the end? Where can you go? See, this salvation, this is a work of God. Jesus said it well when he said, these things, is, this is impossible to men. And yet, by the same token, very possible to God. Another thing we want to see here, salvation is not a single event, but a work in progress. Too often we hear about someone we're concerned about, and, and have you heard from them? How are they doing? I don't know, but at least they were baptized. Well, it's good that you had a good start, but how are you doing now? You see, salvation is like unto a race. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily entangle, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Salvation is a work in progress, just like race is, and we must keep that in mind. It is called the eternal which he promised in Jesus also. The work of salvation is not a reaction to human need, although it does, in fact, meet human need. It's the unfolding of a divine purpose. We must not forget this. In salvation, God is not being reactive. He's being proactive. He's not looking to men to find what he's going to be doing. He already established his purpose before he ever made man from the dust of the earth. 
We must have a God like that. Human need is not the primary focus of the work, divine working, and the glory that follows is, as Brother Jeremy said this morning. I appreciated that comment. You see, God has called us unto His kingdom and glory. Amen. Too often we hear about God coming down and identifying with us, and, I, and there's a sense of truth to that. Don't get me wrong, but the greater identity is us being identified with Him. <laughs> That's the important thing to see. And thank God He has called us to His kingdom and glory. Another thing we want to see, the work of salvation gives pleasure to God. Do you, have, do you have a God that rejoices in giving you mercy? Do you have a God like that? Or when you come back in your time of need and look for strength when you're weak, think that God looks at you as if, oh, coming back again, why can't you just remain strong? You see, this is a wonderful work of salvation. God purposed the work. <laughs> so that it would be bring pleasure unto himself. It's so important that we see that. In fact, when Paul wrote to the Philippians, he encouraged them, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. See, he finds satisfaction in the work in progress. So important that we understand that. Another thing that we want to see the power that brings and sustains our salvation comes through the proclamation of the gospel. That's how it comes. If the gospel is not in vogue, then men will go to hell. That's how it works. The gospel is the exclusive means by which God saves men. So if men do not preach the gospel, men are not going to be saved. It's not going to happen. You see, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And the gospel is still the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Amen. Another thing we want to see here, the work of salvation transforms men to conform to God's desires, not vice versa. Amen. We ought not to form a God that, is, that surrounds carnal desires that we would have. In fact, I'm not even interested in a God like that, are you? And yet, that's the very kind of Jesus that we have preached from the pulpits all the time. The church has become a YMCA where you can come and kind of get whatever kind of need that you have and want. You can kind of find this quadrant of the church where that kind of thing that you want to do will be taking place. Well, that's just, that's not the salvation of God at all. I'm with, I can't remember the brother that said this, but a salvation that doesn't change us, I'm like not interested in a salvation like that. Are you? I didn't like who I was. <laughs> I want to be something different. The work of salvation transforms men. Whom he did foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first, firstborn among many brethren. Salvation is still by grace through faith. Grace and faith are the root. Works happen to be the fruit. We don't shy away from talking about works. We're not afraid to be examined. Because grace and faith produce the works that God requires. So we're not afraid of that. And by the same token, we're not afraid to emphasize grace. Or to talk a lot about faith. Because it's the root from which springs all the good things that God desires. By grace are you saved through faith, this not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are the workmanship of God, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which he hath foreordained that we should walk in them. So it's important as we look at the book of Daniel and we look at the dominion of Christ, everything that we say about Daniel 7 must, must relate to everything we've said about salvation. If it's unrelated to salvation, then I'm sorry, we're off in left field. We really haven't divided the word of truth rightly. So let's look at the text. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion, and glory, and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. I've titled this message, The Post-Cross Christ empowered to save. <laughs> you see, Christ was crucified through weakness, but he reigns with unequivocal power. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion. He was put to shame then, but now he's been given glory. There was given him dominion and glory. He came to the earth to serve, but he reigns to be served. There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. He laid the foundation for salvation on earth, but he builds the building from heaven. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And we don't know of him ever leaving, do we? Except for maybe one occasion with Paul. Another thing we want to see here, he came to the earth in the likeness of sinful flesh. But he reigns as a glorified man. When Jesus went back to heaven, he did not take off the robes of humanity, so to speak. Okay? He's a glorified man. It's so important that we understand that. He did not go back to heaven and then just become the word only. You understand he will always be the word. He is God. And by the same token, he is man. I saw one like the son of man. Why like? Does that imply that he's not a man? No, it implies that he is a glorified, glorified man. The same man that John saw in the heavenly vision. What a wonderful thing. Do you understand what a marvelous thing that is? This is the first time in recorded scriptural history that a man has stepped into heaven. And I, I, I could go further than that, but I didn't want to trample on Tim's sermon, so I'm just going gonna, gonna to leave that there. So we do have a post-cross Christ now, the context, Christ is returning to heaven after having accomplished his death. And the big important thing of the text is he's presenting himself before the Ancient of Days. You realize in our day there's, there's very little that seems to accentuate the ascension of Christ Jesus. Maybe it's touched on when we talk about the resurrection, but just opening up the ascension itself. I mean, you've got to ask, you, ask yourself, when was the last time you heard a sermon that was just upon the ascension? Why, why do you think that is? Well, I think one of the reasons is, is because men don't understand the criticality of the ascension. How important this is. See, this text is a pivotal point, <laughs> particularly as salvation is being administered to men. This is pivotal. Jesus must be received in heaven if he's going to administrate salvation to men. It's so important that we understand that. There are a lot of texts about the ascension. I'm just going to give you one. Ephesians 4, 8 says, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, my text happens to be right there between him ascending and giving gifts and delivering. So you can see how pivotal this is. For the atonement to be effective for us, Christ had to present himself in heaven to the Father. So important to understand that. And this is depicted actually under the Levitical system that we find in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 15 to 17, as it relates to the sacrifice for sins. It says, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat before the mercy seat, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. Down in verse 17, And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. So we can see there was, there was more needed for Christ to make an atonement than just dying itself. He had to come in into the very presence of God, come in, in order to make that atonement as depicted in that text. There are two things to be seen in this text that I think are so important. First, the Father had to place his seal of approval to Christ's work on the cross. Amen. Daniel 7 tells us he is approved. He came to the Ancient of Days, and it's the Ancient of Days that gave him dominion. And it's the Ancient of Days that gave him glory. And it's by virtue of this that the Ancient of Days intended that all nations should serve this glorified Christ. Another thing to see, for salvation to be brought to men from heaven, Christ had to resume his place in glory to administer it. That's the whole reason for the holy place being sanctified by blood 
In order for grace to come to you from heaven, in order for the new man to be given to men, in order for the spirit to be sent out, there had to be a man in glory to do just that very thing. Amen. See, the atonement must not only be made, it must be administered. Amen. It must be. By a man in glory. And you realize the benefits of it because of this text before us. He's been received. What a wonderful truth to see. I'd like to say more on that, but I really want to get more to the heart of his dominion. Some general things as we look at Christ's dominion. He's been given dominion. I want to take a moment just here to define dominion. Dominion is like a domain in which there is an effective operation of power that's exerted to fulfill a purpose. Okay, let me just unpack that for just a second. When we talk about a domain, I'm going to get to that here in just a moment. Okay, so just kind of put that on the back burner. When we talk about an effective operation in a domain, effective, what I mean by that is Jesus operates unhindered. It's amazing how many songs we sang this morning and this afternoon that talk about him being unchallenged. <laughs> Nobody can truly challenge Jesus in the work of salvation. Nebuchadnezzar was one who learned that lesson in the book of Daniel chapter 4 and verse 35. After going into the school of chewing the cud... When he came back out, he learned very effectively and proclaimed to all nations, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He did according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand and say unto him, What doest thou? That's the same dominion which Jesus has received. When we talk about operation, we mean it's a real work that impacts upon real experience. I mean, if salvation doesn't impact upon our experience, it's really not a salvation. You understand that? I'm not interested in a pure academic salvation, are you? Are we here just bantering about ideas? Is that the point here? Or is there something that really happens as we share the truth? Why does that happen? Because there's an operation that's taking place. And it's effective on our behalf. Jesus, when he was in the earth, men looked for signs of him coming from heaven. They wanted a sign from Jesus. And Jesus told him this, If I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. And he reasons, When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. Isn't that something? Who is he casting demons out of? Very real children. Very real people. Now, salvation, the work that's in progress in the present day, is not any less real than that. It's not. It's an operation that's in work. Now, when we talk about a purpose, what we mean by that is power that's directed by wisdom and prudence. See, God's really doing something. And his purpose, his, his power is harnessed by his wisdom and by his prudence, which means he's not distracted from what he intends to do. See? And everything he does works for the will of his purpose. Everything that he does. Now, his purpose happens to be bringing salvation, not putting down enemies. That's really not what it's about. I think that's why people misunderstand his present reign, because like the zealots, they would think that, well, the reason why, the reason why he's reigning is to put down enemies, but no. No, he can reign right in the presence of his enemies. The purpose is to bring salvation. It's not hard to put down enemies, but it's hard to bring you to glory. Much, much more difficult. Look in how many places his kingship is combined with salvation. Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Here's a word that... Uh, it's written in Luke chapter 1, 68 and 69. Blessed be the, God, the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us, whereat in the house of his servant David. <laughs> Fulfilling a prophecy to David that there would never lack a man to sit upon his throne, a king bringing salvation, empowered to do so. And of course, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 and 25, then comes the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put down, put all enemies under his feet. So our king is working salvation, and he's effective at doing it, and he purposes and intends to do it. Now let's get into more specifics about this. 
the specific domains in which Christ works effectively for our salvation because this is a critical matter. I mean, if we have a salvation that has a, or a, a king on our hands that has dominion, which means he, he has a purpose, okay? And he's operating. He's working to do that. And he can effectively do that and unhindered, okay? But the critical issue is how far does this domain, how far is he able to work in that way? I mean, think of it this way. If his domain is this way and salvation is this way, we're in some real trouble, aren't we? We've got to have a Christ that has a domain in which he works that effectively answers every single obstacle the saint faces from the baptismal waters to glory. Amen. We've got to have a, a, have a Savior that, that has that kind of dominion. Now, let me take time for an example. Imagine if it really wasn't an everlasting kingdom. Imagine that. You know, the value of every promise of God in Christ depends upon the eternality of the kingdom. Everyone. Fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What if he gave it to you for one day and then the kingdom was overthrown? What kind of value would that promise have then? You see? It's critical that his domain extend into eternity. And there are other domains where it's critical that his operation is effective and that he can do what he intends to do. So let's look at some of those domains. For example, in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus encouraged his disciples, commissioned them to preach the gospel unto the ends of the earth. And before he said that, he said, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Well, what is the work of salvation? What's God doing? He takes men from the dung hill and he sets them with the princes of his people. That's what he does. Where's the dung hill? On earth. That's where he found me. That's where he found you. Where are the princes of his people? Heavenly places. See, that's what it's all about. I mean, if he can save us from every evil work here and yet we not enter into the heavenly kingdom, it's not a full salvation, is it? Paul said one time, My God shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom mean glory forever and ever. Amen. See, he has power on earth where you're at now to save, and he'll have power on the day that he returns to make sure that is a day for rejoicing as it concerns you. Because he has power in heaven and on earth. How about the realm of the dead and the realm of the living? In Romans chapter 14 and verse 9 it says, To this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. Okay? Now, take Lazarus as an example. After Lazarus had died, Martha and Mary actually confronted Jesus about his death. Told him basically the same thing. If you had been here, my brother had not died. And Jesus said this word, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Why? Why would he live? Because the Christ has received dominion among the dead. Okay? Now, if death's not really an issue for you right now, it will. It'll become an issue. It's an issue for some brethren that are pretty close to us, isn't it? Death is. Hmm? This is a very important thing. There are some godly people that are afraid of death. They need to hear this. Christ has dominion, and it's not only among the living. Amen. It's in the dead just as well. I mean, brethren, if he, if he led you through the valleys here, will he leave you in the valley of the shadow of death? Huh? If he led you in the dark times here, when you face that dark moment of death, will, will he abandon you there? No, he won't. Why? Why? Because he's Lord both of the dead and of the living. Both of those realms. But he goes on to say in that text, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He is Lord now. Hmm? He is Lord in life. So important to see that. And that's why, in fact, that we shall not die. That's why we haven't died. Now, I want to consider this law of sin and death because this is a very important principle. We're encouraged in Romans chapter 8 that Christ has delivered us from the law of sin and death. What is it a law? What kind of law is this? This is a law that kind of draws men back down 
into that slough, so to speak, from which David spoke we were delivered from. Is Christ Lord of that principle as well? He was when he delivered from you from it in the first place, wasn't he? And he still is. He still is that. In fact, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, he'll also quicken your mortal bodies by a spirit that dwells in you. Let me give you an example of that. You know, one of, one of, the, one of the fruits of death is despair and sorrow. Sometimes sorrow can close in on you like it's going to swallow you up again like death. Just draw you down and swallow you up like you'll never be out of that valley and back on a mountain again. But the Savior is the Lord of the dead. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> when he says to death, let loose, death has to let go. That's the way it works. Whether in sorrow or in physical death, has to let go. Why? Because the Christ has received dominion amongst the living and the dead. He's Lord of both. I hope you can see these things. Another domain where it's important that we have a Savior that has dominion is the visible and the invisible. Or the physical and the spiritual. Colossians 1.16 declares, By him were all things created that are in heaven and are in earth, visible and invisible. Do you face foes that are visible? Don't let any man steal your crown. Is that a visible person? That body you're in, does that give you trouble? Is it a visible thing? Yeah, it is. It creates all kinds of conflict. But it can't separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Can't do it. Why? Because Jesus is Lord of the visible, and he's Lord of the invisible. I like this word in John chapter 10. It's meant so much to me. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now, whatever you may think about falling away, which seems pretty obvious to me, that's the obvious thing. It seems like the, people, the, things, that, the things that people don't understand is the fact that you have a God that can keep you from falling. You see, Christ has been given dominion so that you don't fall away. Okay? What a wonderful truth to see. But the reason why is because he's been given dominion in the visible realm where men are and in the invisible man, in invisible realm. Who is our chief foe in the invisible realm? Your enemy, the devil. He is the chief foe that we face. You know, Simon is a marvelous example of the effective intercession of Christ Jesus. The night he was betrayed, Jesus knew that prophecy would be fulfilled, the shepherd would be struck, and the sheep would scatter. But particularly as it re relates to Simon, he knew that the devil wanted particular <laughs> attention towards Simon himself. Because Simon, unbeknownst to the contemporary church, was going to be a key person in the church. Not that rash, speak off the top of your head kind of guy that he's portrayed to be. Not that way at all. And Jesus said unto Simon, 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 behold, Satan has, des has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Yeah. Now listen, here, here's how I reason. If Christ can effectively intercede while on earth, to the end that Satan can launch an attack against Simon, who isn't born again, who doesn't have all the things that you have on this side of the cross, and Simon survived the attack? What can be said about a Savior that's ascended into heaven, has received dominion as a glorified man, and is now able to minister everything that you need for life and godliness? How about that? Well, he's Lord of the invisible. That's what I want to affirm to you. And before it's all over, the God of peace is going to bruise Satan underneath our feet shortly. See? <laughs> he may appear to have the upper hand in some kind of trial that you face, some kind of an accusation that's thrown at you, but we're going to have the last word and the last foot. Don't forget that. The last dominion I want you to see here this evening 
is the things that are present and the things that are to come. You see, Jesus has dominion in time where we happen to be working out our own salvation, <laughs> both now and into the future. He has dominion there. I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. That's something. I, I like that definition of what the work of salvation is really about. It's about getting from now to there saved. Now to then. That's really what it's about, see? And we've got to have a Savior that can do that. He has saved you up till now, but hey, you have a lot of trouble in now, don't you? Tomorrow, if perchance the Savior shouldn't come, you'll face trials in the period of what we call now. <laughs> You've got to have a Savior that's Lord of that, but also a Savior that's Lord extending into the eternal realms. And I'm here to tell you, we do have a Savior that's like that. Amen. Well, in all these things... We don't want to forget that although we've talked a lot about how he meets human need here by his power, we don't want to forget what the real end of the whole thing is about. And I think it's been clarified to some degree, but I want to highlight it again. The great end is not us. Of him, through him, and to him be the glory, right? That's what it's all about. But here's what I'm here to tell you to say that I think is so marvelous as I conclude this. You have the grand opportunity that if you allow for your, through your faith in Christ Jesus for Christ to work in, in you now, he'll be able to roll back your life and your life will redound to the glory of God in the day that Christ visits us. Amen. I'll tell you, there can be no greater honor bestowed upon you than that other than having that personal identity and fellowship with him than that men should look upon you and that you should be an index into the character and person of the living God. In the word of the prophets, that means that you shall be a royal diadem in the hand of your God. And don't forget this, I know you've practiced on your singing, but you know the only ones that are going to be able to sing to the glory of God concerning salvation will be those that will be saved. That's what you have to do to be qualified to sing that. <laughs> salvation to our God and to the Lamb is to yourself be saved. So I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to, if you're, if you're facing some kind of trial now, whatever it is, Christ has dominion there. He has a purpose. He's not left you to the side as you've walked by faith in him. And you'll not be disappointed for having trusted him. He'll bring you home because when Jesus went in the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days, he was received. And not only that, he received dominion.